The first time that the word church appears in the Bible, it is used in the singular form in Matthew 16, 18, which says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus spoke about his church in the singular. He spoke of one church, the church, his church, of which he is head. Jesus didn't say, upon this rock I will build my churches. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. And what I'm preaching about today is the topic of the universal church versus the local church. And the reason why this doctrine is important is because number one, as I mentioned, it's a neglected teaching, especially among Baptists. Number two, lack of knowledge on this topic not only causes division within the body, but it also contributes to a lack of Christian love among believers universally. Because when you understand that we are the church, that we are the individual lively stones, as the Bible calls us, that make up the church, it changes the way that we view one another as believers. Number three, when we understand that we are the church, it also gives us insight into how local congregations are formed. And we'll get a bit to that as well throughout the sermon. Now, when most Baptists preach about the church, their emphasis is almost always focused on the local church. And so, while I also affirm and believe in the local assembly of the church, I want to take a contrarian approach to this topic because, as I mentioned, it's neglected, and I'd like to focus on the universal aspect of the church or the body of Christ when it comes to understanding the church that Jesus built. But I want to first begin by explaining what I'm not talking about. Okay, what I'm not talking about is the ecumenical universal church that will be unilaterally run by the Antichrist. That's the counterfeit universal church, and it will include all religions from apostate Christians to Roman Catholics to Muslims to Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and Hindus and Buddhists and Jews, and even atheists will be included in this counterfeit universal church that will be run by the Antichrist, which is to come. And the only thing that these false religions will have in common is that their God is the devil. Because that is who will ultimately be running the counterfeit universal church. And I understand that that exclusivity within the Christian faith is not a popular message, but that's what the Bible teaches. Only born-again, Bible-believing Christians who have put their faith in Jesus Christ make up the universal church, which is the body of Christ. And I understand also that some people don't like the term universal church, but when I mention that term, I'm talking about globally, all believers that worship God in spirit and in truth. That's who I'm referring to when I talk about the universal church. It's a universal body of believers, the family of Christ, the household of God that makes up the church. So the Bible teaches that there exists a duality between the universal church that Jesus built and the local church, which is a regional expression of that one church that there exists a, mi a macrocosm, which is this universal church, this larger church consisting of all believers, and that the macro is the larger whole, which is the entire body of Christ. That's the macrocosm of the church. And then there is a microcosm, which is, you know, these are secular terms, but, you know, the macro is big, the micro is small. And the microcosm includes the local church, a local expression of the gathering of the individual members of that greater church when they meet. So one is the, the, the greater church, one is the expression of that greater church locally, regionally, when we meet. But some people will say that I'm mixing up the body of Christ with the church. I mean, people are comfortable calling it the body of Christ, 
but they're not comfortable calling the body of Christ the church. Some people, as we've encountered. Now, they'll say that the church is only the assembling together of local believers, but that it is not the church. But that's not what the Bible actually teaches, because we see that the Bible uses the word body interchangeably with the church. And we see this clearly in Ephesians 1. So take a look at Ephesians 1, starting at verse 22, where body is interchanged with church in verse 22, and hath put all things under his feet, speaking about the feet of Jesus, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, and in verse 23, which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So we have a very plain, clear statement from the book of Ephesians right here that says that Jesus is head over all things to the church, comma, which is his body. So the Bible dictionary in the King James defines his body as the church in the singular format. This is speaking of the universal body of Christ consisting of all believers. We also see in Colossians 1, starting at verse 18, that the Bible also uses church and body interchangeably. And in verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, comma, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So, You know, people are not comfortable, some Baptists are not comfortable with calling his body the church in the singular, but the Bible is very comfortable doing that because that's the truth. And others will say that these verses are only speaking of Christ being the head of the local church. They interpret body there as the local church, as the local congregation. But based on the broad language And the context of these verses, Paul is speaking generally of universal concepts. So again, take a look at Ephesians 1, 22. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, to the fullness of him that filleth all in all. This is speaking very broadly, very generally of all the body of believers, not just the microcosm of the local church. And it's the same with Colossians 1, 17 through 18. He is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church. Again, it's being used generally, and in the singular, speaking of the entire one church of Jesus Christ that he built. That doesn't negate the existence of the local expression of that one church in local congregations, but we can't also throw out the baby with the (coughs) bathwater and say that there is no universal church as Baptists and other Christians overreact to the false counterfeit church that we're seeing, which is very typical of what we see them do in many doctrines. And you might say, well, aren't you a Baptist? Yes, I'm a Baptist when Baptist doctrine aligns with the Bible but I'll reject Baptist doctrine and tradition of men when it goes against the scriptures. I'm not a Baptist when it doesn't agree with the Bible. You know, I don't care about upholding the man-made traditions of the church. Okay, and so based on the context of of these passages, Paul was also speaking of the entire church, the entire body, because just a few verses later, Paul says that he has made a minister to the entire church. Colossians 1, 24 through 25, just a couple of verses later. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, comma, which is the church, happens again there, repeated again, wherefore I am made a minister. So, Paul, as an apostle, was made a minister to the whole body of Christ, which he himself calls the church in the universal singular sense of that word. Okay, Paul wasn't made a minister to just the local body as an apostle. He was made a minister to every local congregation, which made up the one church of Christ. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 
is a key verse for this doctrine. This is perhaps the pivotal verse. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, I've already shown you that the word body is used interchangeably with the church in numerous passages. So when the, when the Bible here in Ephesians 4 says there is one body, well, then we know there is one church. That's the church universal. And everything else on that list is also being used in the general broad sense of that term. There is only one faith, singular. There is only one Lord, singular. There is only one God, singular. And there is only one body, singular, which is the one universal church. And in fact, when you think about it, the universal church doctrine, the true universal church doctrine, which says that there's only one faith and one God and one doctrine, and one hope, you know, that actually is a way, is a tool, is a doctrine that can battle against the counterfeit universal church, which says that there are many ways to God, that all the religions are, are valid. This is saying, no, there's only one faith, one God, one church, the true church of believers, which consists of all believers worldwide throughout all ages. <clears throat> so, Romans 12, 5 also says, So we being many are one body in Christ. Who's he talking to? We being many. He's talking about every believer and every one members of another. That's why I'm able to meet a Christian halfway around the world who I've never met, and we can have instant fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ who worship the same God. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, 1 Corinthians 12 also, starting at verse 12. We see this language of the body being frequently <coughs> used and associated as being one body. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. It's saying that we as believers are all united as one in Christ. That's why the head and the body analogy work so well, because we are all one body with Christ as the head. You know, so Christ, if Christ is one head, then there's one body. There's not thousands of bodies, you know, it's just one body. And it says in verse 13, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. We're not baptized into the local church. That's another mistake that many Baptists make. We're baptized into the universal body of Christ when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, and then we show that through baptism, through water baptism as, as, a, as an act of obedience to, to the word. So the moment we become believers, we automatically become a part of God's church. The head and the body analogy only makes sense if you think about it in that sense. So, <clears throat> and then we see that that one universal body expresses itself through numerous multiple local congregations, which the Bible then <coughs> calls the churches. Again, it's the macrocosm versus the microcosm. Ephesians 5, starting at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Again, used in the singular and used interchangeably with the body because it says, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, singular, and gave himself for it, which church did Jesus Christ give himself for? Was it the church at Galatia or the church at Ephesians? You know, or was it the whole church? It was he gave himself for it, the whole church, the whole body of Christ, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, 
not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Notice that in verse 25, Paul speaks in the present tense about the church. Before we are even presented to Christ as holy and without blemish, at, at the millennium or at, or at the heavenly Jerusalem. So this shows that we are the church now because Paul calls us that in the present tense. Some argue, though, that we will only be the universal church when we meet together at the millennial reign of Christ. But the Bible repeatedly calls us the church now in the present, whether we're physically congregated together or not. Because ultimately, the church is not physical, but spiritual. It's not the building. It's not the temple. It's the people. It's the lively stones which make up the church. And as lively stones, we don't stop being the church when we're not gathered together at 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. We are the church all day, every day. But when we assemble corporately and officiate services through worship and prayer and the preaching of the word, Jesus is then in our midst within that local congregation, within that local gathering. That's why Matthew 18.20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The church then exists wherever and whenever believers are officially gathered together in his name. We hold a service at a specific time because it's convenient and conducive to gathering together consistently and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Of, of ourselves together. But if we didn't, we would still be the church, universal. In other words, we don't go to church, we take the church with us wherever we go and wherever we gather because we are ourselves members as lively stones of the church. The church doesn't need to be incorporated to be the church. It doesn't need to have a pastor present to be the church. There doesn't have to be an ordination ceremony for it to be the church. The Bible says nothing about sending out people to start churches. Pastors don't beget churches. Jesus does. The Spirit does. When believers gather with the official intent and purpose of forming new local congregations. Okay, so when we gather as those lively stones, two or three more are gathered, and we purpose in our hearts to start a local congregation, we are the church. Okay, so, but people want to get legalistic about this. And that's what we see coming out of many of these churches, a heavy letter of the law, legalistic type of thinking that goes contrary to the spirit of what the Bible teaches. And what, and what Christ ultimately is about. And I understand that there is truth to the fact that the church universal will not all congregate together at the same time on this earth. We can't gather every single believer together in one room and worship together. So there's some truth to that. That will only happen when we all meet in heaven together. But that doesn't mean that we aren't the church universal right now. We just are not congregating as the entire church in one place. Because the universal church consists of the lively stones and members in particular who make up that church. 1 Peter 2 talks about this. 1 Peter 2, starting at verse 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house in holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So what does the Bible call us? It calls Jesus the living stone, calls us lively stones, a spiritual house in holy priesthood. So we are already as believers a holy priesthood. It's, it's already there. You don't, you don't go out and start the universal church. We are a part of that church. And then we express it when we get together um, locally. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17 also says that we are the church. 
Verse 16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God? What is the temple of God? It's the church. And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So the, the, it's very picturesque. If you think of every individual member sitting in this church right now, is one of the lively stones that make up the church. You know, there's an eye, there's a hand, there's different parts of the body. We're all these lively stones. When we get together, we form all the different various parts of the local congregation. You don't need a pastor to send you out to be the church. You are the church. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. And of the household of God... That's another name for the church and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. See, we're all fitly framed together. All the stones are fitly framed. It's a spiritual house, not a physical building. We are the living stones that make up the church. In verse 22, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So the Bible is saying that as lively stones, the Spirit of God is inside of us, and through that Spirit, God inhabits us. And so Jesus is in our midst through the Spirit, because the Spirit is one of the persons of the Godhead. Okay, so when we gather where two or three are gathered together, we are the church. And some people will say that only has to do with prayer. But that's not, that's not what it's talking about. You know, that would be kind of ludicrous because that would be saying that Jesus is only in our midst when we're praying if two or three more are praying together and that he's not present when it's just one of us. And, you know, it just that, that whole argument falls apart. So... <clears throat> pastors don't beget churches. The Spirit begets churches. The believers beget churches when they make it their mission and their purpose to gather together to form a living community that's going out and preaching the gospel and edifying one another. So forget about the man-made traditions and the 501c3 corporation gatherings and the building fund and the offering plate and the announcements and all the little programs when members of the universal church gather together, we become the local church. And I'm not just talking about hanging out and just praying and doing Bible studies. You know, that would be a very weak church. We need to be out there preaching the gospel. You know, I'm talking about specifically coming together with a purpose in an orderly fashion by the Holy Spirit and banding together with a purpose of serving the living God and his body. Going back to Matthew 16, 18 for a minute. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now this, this passage would only make sense if Jesus was speaking about the universal church and not the local autonomous independent fundamental Baptist churches as they so claim. Okay, because Jesus said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church, speaking in the universal sense. Because we know that Satan does prevail sometimes against the local church and against the local congregation. Local churches are sometimes divided and destroyed. They split due to doctrinal differences and the sin of the members present. But the universal church, which is a spiritual body of believers of all ages who hold fast to the one true faith, cannot be divided or destroyed ever. Okay, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church that Jesus built. That's what he was talking about. He was talking about the universal church of all believers of all ages. And so we see that in Ephesians 3, verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. 
Okay, all ages is not talking about how old you are. It's talking about the span of all time. He says, in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So Paul understood the doctrine of the universal church. He wasn't shy about using the church in a singular, one unified type of way. So the universal church has existed from the first century until now, and it will also exist in heaven. Satan will not be able to prevail against it, just as Jesus promised. So regardless of the general Baptist denial of the existence of the universal church, the Bible teaches that there is a universal church which consists of genuine born-again Bible-believing Christians around the world universally who worship God in spirit and in truth. And we see that in a conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. So take a look at John 4, starting at verse 20. John 4. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. <clears throat> Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the Samaritan woman had this concept of a physical location being necessary for worshiping God. She was at least confused about it or had questions about it. Much like people do today. They think that you go to church, you go to the building, and now you've done your duty and you've gone to, to, that, you know, to that local building. And that's the church. But the church is not the building. Jesus' answer to the Samaritan woman was that the true believers will worship God in spirit and in truth. New covenant worship has nothing to do with the location of the temple itself, as Jesus explained, the church building, the leaders, the pastors, the deacons, or the national geog geography. 1 Corinthians 10.32 says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. All the terms in this verse are being spoken of in the broad, general, universal sense. So again, this is just another proof for it. Jews is talking about all Jews. Gentiles is talking about all Gentiles. Likewise, the church of God is used in a broad sense. It's not talking about how we're to treat the local body, but rather how to treat all Christians everywhere. It says, give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So we're to love every believer universally. We're to treat them as our brothers and our sisters in the Lord the instant that we meet them. And that's, what, that's the danger of, of neglecting the universal church teaching and just focusing exclusively on the local church because then you're only loving, it becomes a little bit inbred and you just love the people that you see around you within your little church clique and your little, your little circle. Um, so that's why this doctrine is important. We're to treat every Christian uh, with Christ's love universally, globally. This verse is also written in the present tense, again, indicating that there is currently a universal church and that we shouldn't give offense to it. Not that there will one day be a universal church of God in the distant millennium when we all meet together. It is happening right now. We are the universal church and body of Christ meeting now here together locally as lively stones. But some people will point to words like the assembly and congregation in the Old Testament and say that you can't have a church unless you're assembled together, that that church does not exist. And using this logic, they claim that the universal church does not exist because the universal church cannot congregate. They say that the universal church doesn't have an address, so it's not a real church. 
Okay, but show me the address of any of these churches oh, yeah. in the Bible, you know, um, other than just that they met at Galatia or they met at Corinth. So they're not seeing the whole picture. They're, they're blinded by their man-made traditions. What they're saying is true of the local church, but not the universal church. Again, they're mixing up the man-made traditions of the location of the building or the man-made organized structure of the church with the universal lively stones and the members of the body of Christ who are the church. Even in the nation of Israel, when the congregation or assembly was mentioned, it referred to the people, not only to the church services, even using the words congregation and assembly. <clears throat> in other words, you had the same duality then also present between the one congregation, which consisted of every Israelite, and the local gathering when they would meet for worship, uh, worship services and animal sacrifices. We see that in Exodus 12, 19. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Now, they would be cut off from the whole people, not just that church service. They would live in exile. So that congregation is talking about the people, the community as the assembly. The whole gathering, the whole congregation, the whole assembly was considered the nation of Israel and the church in the wilderness. Um, they were always the congregation and an assembly of Israel, whether they were at the temple or not. Exodus 16.1, we see this again, and they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of sin. So that community, those lively stones, those people is how it's referring to them here. They traveled around. They weren't locked into one specific place as, a, as an assembly that has to you know, be there to be the church. They were the church when they were moving around. They were the church when they weren't gathered together. They were the church just as we are the church today. So the Bible's use of the word congregation is being misapplied to the local gathering, which is not always how the Bible uses that word. There is only one congregation, one children of Israel, one temple, one service, even to those who were dispersed abroad, to the Jews who weren't living right there in Jerusalem. If they wanted to participate in the yearly blood atonement, they had to travel to Jerusalem to the one temple. Now, they could do it by faith and still be saved, but if they wanted to participate in that church service, there's that one temple which existed, and that one temple ultimately foreshadowed the one church of Christ. So that's where we see, you know, we always see foreshadowings in the Old Testament of the new, the one temple, the one church. Now we are all those lively stones of the temple. So <clears throat> having made those points, um, I just want to make one last point, which is um, just one last section here, looking at the origin of the church itself. Because when we look at how the church formed in the beginning, how it all began, it sheds great light on this topic. The very first church came into being in Jerusalem. <clears throat> so, the very first church came into being in Jerusalem. It was the only church, the one church that Jesus built. <clears throat> and the Bible repeatedly says that the members who made up the church were of one accord. We see that beginning in, in the book of Acts, Acts 1.14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Acts 2.1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So we see this picture of unity among the early believers. And then we see a great number of believers added to the church. Acts 2.41, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And we see that the unity of believers in the one church was never broken at this point. Because in verse 42, the very next verse, verse says, And they continued 
steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So before we had the written word in the New Testament, which was not yet written, the epistles were not yet written, the apostles made sure that every believer was united in doctrine and in fellowship. And in verse 44, it continues, And all that believed were together and had all things common. Again, we see it again. It's repeated over and over again. Verse 46, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So in every way, that early church was one. It was one church. And then we see in verse 47 that the believers again are called the church praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts 4.32, a few chapters later, says again, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. So continuity between all the early believers as one church, even though there were thousands of them in the beginning. But then we get to Acts 8, and this is where things change. And in Acts 8, persecution has overtaken, has overtaken the church by the hands of the Jews, the physical circumcision, including Saul, who later became Paul the Apostle. Acts 8 describes the persecution and dispersal of the one church. Church. Acts 8, starting at verse 1. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And in verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So you have this picture of that one united church. When they get persecuted, they get spread abroad. And when they get spread abroad, they don't sit on their hands and feet and wait for Pastor Anderson or Pastor Romero or whoever else to send them out to start preaching. Okay, they start preaching the word and they start banding together into local congregations as an expression of that one universal church. Okay, they didn't wait. The persecution is what sent them out. And as they preached the gospel and banded together in various regions, that one church which had begun in Jerusalem spread abroad to various local regions like Judea and Samaria. And these became the local expressions of the one church that Jesus began in Jerusalem. It was the same church, except now they'd branched into multiple local congregations stemming from the one universal church that Jesus built starting in Jerusalem. And this goes along with how Jesus first came to preach the gospel to the Jews. And once they rejected him, it was opened up unto all nations. In Acts 9.31, after the persecution and dispersal, we see the first time the word churches appears in plural. It's the first time the word churches appears after that dispersal and after that persecution. Acts 9.31, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. We even see the exact same regions being mentioned. In Acts 8, the Bible refers to the persecuted as believers who got dispersed. In Acts 9, the Bible refers to the same believers as the churches. So that's, that's the first point. First, it's the people in the one church being persecuted in Acts 8. And then in Acts 9, those same exact people are referred to as the churches. They became the churches simply by being those, having all those different lively stones which were in one place were now spread abroad, banded together, lively stone upon lively stone, and formed the church 
itself, the local church. And then we see that, like I said earlier, that the same regions are even mentioned confirming this. Acts 8 says, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. That was when they were being persecuted. And then in Acts 9 it says, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. So we see a, you know, an incredible connection there between the universal church, how, how churches are formed as they were persecuted, as those believers gathered, that was when the church started. You don't even need to go to seminary. You don't need to get approval. You know, you need that local congregation to approve you as you, as you qualify for the offices of the bishop or the pastor, you know, or the shepherd. So that's another topic. Uh, that we're going to get into in the future about how churches start, about how churches form, about the sent out heresy that's being preached. We're going to get into that. So that's why we see throughout the epistles, Paul refers to the churches as the church at Corinth because they all started as it's still that same one universal church. It's the same church, the church at Corinth, the church at Ephesus, the church at Rome. This was the church located at Rome, now located at Ephesus, now located at Corinth. Okay, still one church, still one doctrine, but expressing itself locally with overseers appointed to guide the flock in each various region. So they didn't have, they didn't even have names. You know, they weren't this autonomous you know, sort of church where, you know, we're just going to do whatever we want. You guys do whatever you want, you know. But at that time, they didn't have the, the written word, so they had the original apostles going around and setting things in order and, you know, creating uh, peace and order and, and correct doctrine within those churches and affirming those that needed to be, that were preaching the right doctrine. But now we have the word of God. You know, so we have instructions in the New Testament on what it, how we're qualified as bishops and pastors, and the local church itself can then approve of of the um, of the offices within the church and verify and confirm um, as those lively stones as the priests and kings before God, which we all are. So. This was just this was how it worked. We see also in Acts thirteen one. Um, a church, the church at Antioch, was one of the first churches that started. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. So again, it just says in the church that was at Antioch. It's that same one church. It's just now at Antioch is where they're meeting. Romans 16.3 says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. So in some cases, and in actually probably most of these cases, um, if not all, they were meeting in houses in the early church. It was just the church, and their location was in their house. Okay, it's that same one church. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So again, it's the church, unto the church of God, okay, which is at Corinth. You have to divide, rightly divide the word. Revelation 2, 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. Galatians 1, 2, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Now in Galatia, there happen to be multiple churches, meeting in, in Galatia. So Paul calls them the churches, referring to the local congregations of the one church of God. Um, likely, there were probably numerous houses that the you know, different believers were meeting in. It might have been a bigger church and they needed numerous houses. It's conjecture, but you know, likely there were just multiple houses, which were churches, and uh, they were meeting there as different churches. In Acts 20, 28, Paul addressed the church at Ephesus as the church of God, also in the singular, again affirming that they are the church spread abroad. So with that said, you know, that's sort of an intro into the ordination uh, sermon. 
um, the sent out heresy that Marshall is going to preach um, coming up. He has a, another topic or two before that, but we are going to get to that. Um, but in conclusion, it's no mystery. You know, there is a universal church, and at the same time, there are local churches. They exist simultaneously. The local churches are localized expressions of the one true church, comprised of all believers who worship God in spirit and in truth. The idea of being this autonomous and independent church is a uniquely American concept, not biblical in nature. Now, I affirm that as this church, you know, we have autonomy in the sense that one pastor can't come in here and start telling us what to do. You know, this is the church that God has entrusted to us. So we are local. We are independent. We also affirm that local independent church. But ultimately, the final authority is the word of God. You know, that is our authority. But we should all, as all the churches globally, be defined by the same doctrine. There should be unity among every single church that exists in the world today, every true church of God in terms of doctrine, in terms of, you know, helping each other out when it's within our means to do so. Um, so understanding this helps us to strive to love and to edify the believers globally, all believers globally. Understanding the universal church doctrine broadens our sense of responsibility to the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 2 through 6, we read earlier, but let's get it in its context. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Okay, so we're to be lowly, meek, long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Who is this talking about? Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So we're to love the whole body of Christ. And that's the danger of not understanding the universal church doctrine because people will start slighting other believers who don't go to their churches and not treating them as they should in the Lord. And one day we will all meet together. The whole universal church will meet together. All believers will congregate together in the heavenly Jerusalem. We see that, we'll close with this in Hebrews 12, 22 through 25, uh, 23. But ye are come unto Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. So there's a lot just in those two verses. You know, there's going to be an innumerable company of angels. What a glorious sight that's going to be to actually witness that with our eyes, with our spirit, you know, to actually see that in our resurrected bodies. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, you know, we will all be there. We are all one church universally of the firstborn, which is Christ himself, which are written in heaven. Our names as those lively stones are written right now in heaven in the book of life. We are members of the church of God. And that's just as a side note, um, you know, this idea of, of official church membership within your local church, you know, it's not a biblical concept. Our names are already written in heaven. We are members of the church universal. And in spirit, you're all members of this church, but you don't have to fill anything out, you know, or commit to a certain amount of money to be a part of this church. That's not how it works. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, from depth and understanding from your word. Help the body of Christ, God, globally, universally, to unite under true doctrine and to stand firm against the counterfeit church that is coming on the scene where, you know, the, the Antichrist and the Pope 
and everyone else who's trying to unite the, the uh, fallen Christians and the, the apostasy that's coming, God. Help us to stand firm against that, every believer everywhere across the globe, to stand firm on the one truth, the one faith, the one body that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.